the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses from 5 to 17. Those who live in according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God's. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Appa, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Let's just pray. Father, we just pray for uh, Graham as he speaks. Help us to receive what you have to say to us. And help him to just know your guidance in what he says. But we want to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. We want to know that uh, what you have to say to us uh, can be life-changing. Can we uh, change how we think about ourselves and how we think about you? So we pray, Father, that we don't just hear, but we receive and we do in Jesus name Amen Thanks Isabel and good morning it's great to have the opportunity I'm going to move this out of the way for a minute it's great to have the opportunity to um, share something of God's word um, this morning. As, as Isabel says, we come to the last in our series of looking at what it means um, to be in Christ, to have that identity um, that comes from our relationship uh, with him. And we are all used to the idea of people being in one group or another. I look out at the moment, there's people on on my left, there's people on, on my right. People have moved as well. Um, football supporters are a great example of this. You're either in that tribe or you're in the other. Marmite lovers or Marmite 
haters. Republican or Democrat, if you follow US politics at all. Whether it's right to put Christmas decorations up early <laughs> or just before Christmas Day itself. There are different views on this, apparently. <laughs> Even which translation of the Bible people prefer. And sometimes the boundaries between these groups are like thick, 20 feet high walls that are impossible to get over. Well, with others, it's more of a, a painted line on the ground um, where it's relatively easy for someone to have a foot in both camps, just as whether people prefer tea or coffee. Although a week or so ago, I was fairly mercilessly mocked by my grandchildren for preferring coffee over hot chocolate. They just, they just are wrong, but, but what can you do? And this idea of, of people being in one group or another is something that we find throughout uh, the Bible. Psalm 1, for example, speaks about two groups of people. One group spoken of as being blessed, while the other group is spoken of as being wicked. Jesus um, spoke about a few people being on a narrow road that leads to life, while most people, he says, were on a broad road leading to destruction. Two groups of people. Paul speaks about believers as, as those who were once darkness, but were now light. And clearly, um, in Paul's thinking, there's the opportunity, opportunity to move from the realm of darkness into the realm of light. Paul says that is what the believers have done. And we have the same idea in our passage this morning with the statement that some people live in the realm of the flesh while others live in the realm of the spirit. And when Paul speaks about the flesh, he isn't normally referring to our physical bodies, but to our sinful nature. Those natures that seek to pull us into ways of living that are opposed to what God wants for us, opposed to the best that Jesus died to make possible. And I don't know if you noticed when Mary was reading, but the, the contrast in this passage between those who are in that group and those who are in the other group is very stark. Paul says that those living according to the flesh, those living in the realm of the flesh, they are, it's as though they were dead. They're hostile to God. They are unable to please God. Whereas those living in the realm of the Spirit enjoy life and peace, experience the abundant life that is only possible in Jesus, become loved members of God's family. And this morning, in this, in this final part of our, our series, we are thinking about being in the Spirit and the wonderful blessings that brings, along with one or two things we might prefer to avoid, but we'll get to those a bit later. Verse 9, Paul says this, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And here, Paul is saying something that is immensely powerful and encouraging. He's speaking to the Roman believers. He's making it abundantly clear to them which camp they are in, that they are in the realm of the Spirit. And this, he says, goes hand in hand with being a follower of Jesus. If you have one, you have the other. And that's a wonderful thing. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning, this is the wonderful position you have been drawn into. You have moved from the realm of flesh to the realm of the Spirit because of your faith and trust in Jesus, a place of freedom, a place of hope, a place of light and life. Paul is not suggesting that we are the finished article. Ian was sharing a couple of weeks ago about the reality that we are all works in progress. He was speaking about the wonderful truth that God will complete the good work in us that he has started. But Paul is saying that we've made a step. We've moved from one place to another that we are free from the control of sin, 
that we are dead to sin's power. Paul has looked at this in detail in Romans chapter 6, a couple of chapters before. And as Chris was sharing last week, based on the earlier verses in, in Romans 8, we are no longer condemned as a result of what Jesus has done. This is all possible because we've moved from here to here, from the realm of the flesh to the realm of the Spirit. Yes, we all need to grow in our relationship with, you, with, with the Spirit, but it is good to recognize that from the moment we commit ourselves to Jesus, the Spirit has chosen to come and take residence in our lives. Just as the Son of God stepped down into the world and walked among his people in the person of Jesus, so the Spirit of God comes down into the world and lives within his people. As well as living in the realm of the Spirit, in that place that is under the authority and control of the Spirit, we have the amazing privilege of the Spirit of God living within us to lift us, to guide us, to encourage us, to correct us, to point us towards Jesus. Jesus, before he died, told his followers that this is what would happen. He would ask the Father to send the Spirit, and the Spirit would do these amazing things to teach and to correct and to point um, to Jesus. And this is what has happened. This is part of our identity. As followers of Jesus, we live in the realm of the Spirit, and we have the Spirit living within us. Paul goes on. If Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. One of the implications of all of this, according to, to Paul, is that we enter into a new dimension of life. Our lives are not the same as they once were. Yes, our physical bodies are, are still subject to pain, to disease, to wearing out, eventually to death. But this does not define us. We have the indwelling presence of God within us, giving us a deeper experience of life than would otherwise be possible. We are, in the words of Jesus, able to have life and have it to the full, have it in its abundance. And if, Paul says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because it is spirit who lives in you. The end of the journey that we are on is that we'll, we will be given new eternal bodies through the spirit that lives in us. We can have confidence in this destiny as the same spirit who is going to do that for us is the one who brought Jesus back to life. He's done it for Jesus. He will do it for us. This is Paul's argument. And Paul develops this theme much more fully in, in 1 Corinthians 15. It's well worth reading and reflecting on. It's a passage that speaks so powerfully and wonderfully about the, the death of Jesus, yes, but also about the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection life that Jesus is experiencing now and the resurrection life that we can look forward to. It's an amazing passage to read and to think about. But here, Paul simply points to the future ahead of us, when all the limitations of our current bodies will be left behind. There'll be distant memories as pain and suffering and disease will be things of the past. And we enter into the fullness of the life that Jesus has gone before us to prepare. All of this is possible. All of this is guaranteed because we are in the Spirit. It's an amazing, it's a wonderful thing. And building on that, in the remaining verses in this passage, Paul brings two challenges to his believers, to his readers. The Roman believers then, and now to us. We have an obligation, he says, not to live according to the flesh, 
If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. What Paul is doing here, as he so often does, is he encourages us to live as the people we are. This is our identity, Paul has been saying. And as a consequence of that, this is how we are to live. It's not that we're to live in a particular way so that we become different people. It's because we are different people, Paul is saying, this is how we should live. And here he's saying that as a result of what the Spirit is doing in our lives, we have a a moral obligation, a responsibility to live differently, to choose to leave behind things that are part of our sinful nature. And this can often mean having to fight against and resist very real temptation. Or as Paul says, to put those things to death. And this can be difficult. We need to recognize this. This can be difficult for a number of reasons. It goes against the culture of our society, where we are encouraged to do whatever we want so long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. But here we are being called to a higher standard, to measure what we want to do against what is pleasing to God and to live as he would want us to. Sometimes those things that tempt us are really attractive. That's why they're temptations. And it's really easy to think that that giving in just once can't really be a problem. But, and many of us have probably experienced this, giving into something once can make it so much easier to do the same the next time around. I found this to be true on different occasions. Whereas what Paul is is doing is encouraging us to do the, the opposite, to resist strongly, to put these desires to death so that they have no place, no presence, no influence on our lives. And sometimes we're just prepared to settle for second best, to go along with the expectations of society, to choose the easy path, and not to seek the abundance of life that is only possible as we seek to live fully in the Spirit. We can do it. We can put to death the misdeeds of the body. We can experience the fullness of the life that Jesus came to make possible and that the indwelling Spirit offers us. We can, but it's not automatic. And that raises a question for each of us this morning. Are we prepared to make those hard choices of having nothing to do with those things that would draw us away from the best that God has for us? And those temptations will be different for each of us. And so we each have to make different choices, maybe at different stages in our lives, as to whether we are prepared to put to death, to have nothing to do with anything that would draw us away from the great and the wonderful plans that God has for us. Paul goes on. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul has taken some time to speak about the process of adoption. We were thinking about that some weeks ago, that amazing reality that those of us who belong to to Jesus, who trust in Jesus, who believe in Jesus, have been adopted. We've come into that new family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus willing to call us part of his family. Able to come to God as Father knowing that nothing and nobody can get in the way. And Paul is saying here that it's the Spirit within us who makes it clear to us that we are children of God. What a wonderful place of privilege to be in. Paul speaks about how this will result in us receiving 
an inheritance from God, of, of sharing in the glory that Jesus has entered into, being co-heirs with Christ. It's, it's an amazing thing to try and get our heads around, that the, the blessings that the Father has for his Son are things that Jesus is going to share with us. That's what Paul is talking about when he talks about the glory that is ahead of us. But Paul does say that for those of us that will look forward to that wonderful future, we should expect to experience times of suffering on the journey to get there. You may remember that after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, Jesus was speaking about uh, speaking to two um, of his followers, and he spoke about the Messiah having to suffer death before entering into his glory. In Hebrews, we find Jesus being spoken about as being crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. We find that Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. For Jesus, the path to glory involved suffering. He knew that that was going to be the case before he came down into the world. But he willingly chose to step into our darkness. To take that path of suffering. So that we could enter into all the wonderful things we've been thinking about over these last few weeks. And so because for Jesus the path to glory involves suffering, it is not at all surprising that our path to the glorious future ahead of us will also involve suffering as we respond to the clear invitation of Jesus to his followers to pick up their crosses each day and to follow him. This suffering might take many different forms. In some, some countries, it can mean imprisonment, persecution, and death. For us, it is more likely to mean criticism and being laughed at. It can mean being ignored for promotion in our workplaces. It can, it can exclude us from certain things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, um, I, I was interested in, a, in an offer that a particular company was, was making um, to um, provide some uh, finance into, into certain areas of things that um, would be helpful. And so I was looking at what, to see whether we as a church could benefit from it. And I noticed that they provided uh, discounts for what they were doing um, for, for non-profit organizations. But religious groups were explicitly excluded. And we see this lots of times. And even that, there's, there's something that gets in the way because we have chosen to follow Jesus. Suffering can take different forms. And different people amongst us have experienced it and continue to experience it in different ways. What Paul is saying here is it is not something that should surprise us as we seek to live in the Spirit. It is something rather that should be expected as we follow a Saviour who suffered so much more than we can ever imagine. Peter speaks to it like this. Rejoice! inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And Peter here and Paul is, is not talking about you know, the sufferings due to you know, the same problems that everybody else has, ill health and financial concerns and, and whatever. He's talking specifically about the suffering that comes because we have chosen to follow Jesus. And in Peter's case, he was writing to a group of people, we believe they were suffering deeply for their faith. And he's encouraging them not to be surprised by it, but to rejoice in it because of the wonderful future ahead of them. And this is countercultural. This is not what we expect. It's probably not what we like. But what Paul is saying, what Peter is saying, is that we should not be surprised when it happens. We don't know what form that might take in our country 
over the next few years. One of the things that, um, as, as leaders in, in the town, we've been reflecting on over the last few weeks as we prepared for uh, yesterday and, and next Sunday, is we have been invited by the local authorities to do something publicly in the centre of town as a, to speak about Jesus. They didn't quite know exactly what we were going to say. But we have been invited. And that's an amazing thing. It's a long way from being persecuted. But that might change. We don't know. Let's not be surprised when and if it happens. Let's be prepared to welcome it as an indication that we are prepared to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Some of those early followers of Jesus, after the... Uh, after he died and gone back to heaven and they were trying to work out what it means and the authorities were trying to work out what it means. The authorities didn't like what these followers of Jesus were saying. They, they took them and they told them to stop and they refused and they beat them and then let them go and they rejoiced because they had been found worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus. And sometimes this may be our calling. And if it is, we are following in the footsteps of Jesus. We won't enjoy it. But it may be something that we are called to. And that's why it's so important to know that we are living in the power of the Spirit. That we are living in unity together so that we can support each other in whatever is ahead. I want to finish by briefly pointing out three different ways in which being in the Spirit can and should affect how we live. John 4. God is Spirit. His worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Here, Jesus is speaking to a lonely woman at a well. He's pointing her to a deeper understanding of God, and he speaks about the need for people to worship God in the Spirit. As we meet together at times like these, as we spend time in smaller groups together, as we spend time with God on our own, let's worship him in the power of the life that the Spirit gives us. Paul also says in Ephesians 6, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. The reality of being in the Spirit should affect our prayers and requests to God. It enables us to draw close to God, to seek to understand his plans and purposes, and to pray in line with those. Revelation. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And these words of John introduce a wonderful vision he had of Jesus, which led him into an amazing journey to see something of the way in which God is finally going to restore creation through Jesus. And it was possible because he was in the Spirit. He was in exile. He was probably alone. He had suffered persecution. But he wasn't allowing himself to be down about it. He was just spending time with God in the Spirit. He was in an attitude of being open to God, of being open to the Spirit working in him, of being prepared for God to speak. And let's be people who delight to simply come to God through his Spirit within us, to spend time with him, and to listen to what he wants to say to us. All of these things, and so much more, are made possible because the Spirit is in us, and we are in the Spirit. Let's recognize that. Let's rejoice in that. Let's live in the reality of it. As we draw our series to a close, our series where we've been looking at the wonderful things that flow from our identity in Jesus, I hope and pray it's been a, a blessing to you as we, we've been reminded of some of the wonderful things that we receive as a consequence of our identity in Christ. Let's continue to explore these themes 
and to live them out in the different situations we are in during the week. And I just want to trail something that we're planning to do in the first quarter of next year. Starting in January, we're going to be exploring further one of the implications of being in the Spirit. The wonderful truth that this Spirit gives gifts to his people. Paul speaks about this in in various places. Uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and, and others. And it's an amazing thing that God gifts his people through his Spirit with many, many different ways in which we can live for and serve him and support and encourage each other. And we're going to be focusing on one particular gift. We might talk about a few others along the way, but our focus is going to be on the gift of prophecy. And this is something that we've been reflecting on, praying into for some time as leaders. Um, as it, It's a desire to develop much more of a prophetic culture within the church, where we are hearing God speak to us in many different ways about what's important to him and what he's saying to us as a people. And we're going to be exploring that in the first few months of the next year. Um, Our plans are coming together. There are a few details we haven't worked out yet, um, but really looking forward uh, to sharing that with you. And please pray that God will speak powerfully to us through it. I'm going to pray as we bring this series to a close, and then Heather and the group are going to lead us in one last song. Father, I want to thank you as we come to the end of uh, this series that we have been able to think about so many of the ways in which our identity in you changes us, transforms us, gives us a life that is so amazingly fulfilling because of who you are and what you have done. And we thank you for the different things we've been able to explore, the different things we've been able to understand and the different things that we have grown into as we have shared these things together. And Father, as we rejoice in the reality of being in the Spirit and the Spirit being within us, I pray that that will will fill us, will change us, will transform us so that we can draw closer to and become more like Jesus. Pray your blessing and give you thanks. Amen.